It's okay, sir. <laughs> Basic, the, okay, philosophy of history. That's the course title. Definitions of historiography. Oh, yes. of history. Now, grab the gun. Beat him. Ah. What's wrong with you? What? Good. What is this? Good day, sir. You are watching Jackie Pan in my house. Who is King Kong, sir? Eh? King Kong. You, you've never heard of ACTV before in your life. ACTV is very educative, informative, and there are for most part there. There is entertainment. There are a lot of things you can do. You can even attend lectures here. All you know is watch all those nonsense artists and do, do nonsense or uh, you watch nonsense on TV. Eh? Last night you almost came in bed with your fist. It's not me, sir. Eh? You, and you wake up every morning, the bed will be so rough, like you've been fighting for food in your dream. Eh? That's the reason why you have F's in your courses, like but I have special image for you. I have you last semester. E, we eat by pounds on you. Very stupid. Oh, yeah, change that session to ACTV right now. And oh, God, the baby to have you first born. Eh? Stupid boy. Okay. Here, welcome to ADME College of Education, Department of History, 2019-2020, Amatan Semester, Bachelor of Arts and Education, History 401, and uh, the title is Philosophy of History. We have my outlines that are made up of nine items, basic definitions of historiography or philosophy of history, which is the topic I'm going to be treating today. Number two, we have what is history, and that is to tell you that all that you have studied from degree one to degree four, you have not yet been taught what it is. Next, you are going to be taught what are the antecedents of history. Then you are going to be looking at number four, which is the beginning of scientific history. Were there scientific history before Herodotus? The answer is no. What obtained before that time was or were not scientific history. The way he carried out his investigation, the way he was succeeded by people that came after him, like Thucydides, and several other scholars that came after him, made their work to be scientific in nature. Then we talk about number five, which is the tra di different traditions of historical thinking. We are looking at the West. And when we are looking at the West, we are going to be looking at Hellenistic era. We are going to be looking at Greco-Roman historiography. We are going to be looking at Christian era historiography. These are distinct eras. And these are distinct, these have distinct characters. But then we are going to be looking at uh, the Renaissance historiographical tradition. And that is where we are going to be looking at basically Islamic historiography and African historiography. They have unique and distinct uh, outlook. They are different in outlook, and it is easy for anybody who is a perceptive historian to know that this is Islamic historiography, this is African historiography. They also contributed different things to the world of history. Then we come to what we call post-Renaissance historiography. That is where we are going to be looking at what people contributed uh, from about the 17th century, 18th century, 19th century, and possibly this 28th century and 21st century as well. So we will begin from the works of people like Jim Bodin. We are going to be looking at the works of Gian Battista Vico, Ren Descartes, Immanuel Kant, Egel. If possible, we take more. But I'm not too sure time will take us, would permit us to look through, to look at all of those. But we will take as many of them as we can. 
especially to guide us. Then we'll be looking at historical positivism of the 19th century. A group of people just came in the 19th century and began to argue and to push that there is something called positivism. They are, they are not talking about a positive way of life or positive uh, confession like you are talking about these days. What they were talking about was slightly different. So we are going to be looking at their work. And then we have historical materialism. You must have heard about uh, Karl Marx. You must have heard about people like uh, Engel. Don't forget I highly mentioned Engel. Engel is different from Engel. And with time we are going to be seeing some of those. Today, we are going to be focusing on basic definitions of historiography or philosophy of history. And my teaching today is based on a number of history scholars' perception of the issue under consideration. What did they think about it? So I'm going to be mentioning people like François Vautour. François Vautour in, was an 18th century scholar that argued and described scientific history or critical thinking. He described them as progressive development of a society independent of what is called the will of God. That before that time, people see everything that happened, they say is God. When you, somebody slap another person before you know it, they say it's God that made him to slap the person. When another person misbehaves in the society, when a leader becomes a wicked leader, instead of actually tackling that leader, we begin to refer to Satan. And we begin, and these were the scholars that came up with the idea, no, let's look at that man himself. What did he do? Why did he do it? What were the circumstances surrounding him? You know, sometimes some leaders are actually not bad. But the people around them makes it difficult for them to behave in a particular way. So Voltaire was one of the people that opened our eyes to this kind of thing. Progressive development of society, independent of the will of God. And then we have another German scholar that came up not too long after that. That's the one I call Egel. And I want you to mark the spelling H-E-G-E-L. Egel is different from Engel. We are going to be talking about the differences much later when we start talking about Egel and Engel. It will, be, it will be easy for you to see. What is important for now is that Egel was a German scholar, a German philosopher, and he used historiography in his reference to universal or world history as opposed to empirical or local or natural history. Before that time, you know what we call empirical research. You go out. Those of you that are doing your researches in education, you go out, you distribute questionnaire, students will feel, they say yes, they say no, and then you start counting how many people are saying yes, how many people have said no to this question. And then you bring up the Likert scale, you are analyzing, you are using correlation coefficient, and the rest of it, those are just empirical. Now, you are talking about historical research, human beings are involved, and the tendency for somebody to change his behavior at the moment of recording. You see, as I'm online now discussing this with you, some things I may be doing that are actually mechanical. Some things that you, are that you may be doing because people are looking at you, they actually, some of them are actually mechanical. The reason is because you are a human being. So if you see human beings behaving that way, you will need something stronger than questionnaire to find out why they behave the way they are behaving. And that's what we do in historical research. And that's what we use historiography to do. By the beginning of the 20th century, explanation of the idea of philosophy of history had gradually began to shift focus. And what were they saying? By that time, that's about the beginning of the 20th century, they were referring to histor historiography as the second degree of thoughts about the past. If you put people together and you put just one or two historians among them, don't be surprised that when everybody is just uh, taking what you are saying without asking questions, that historian will ask you a question. You will be wondering why you have to say something the way you are saying it. And that is what makes you... Now, this, in this, this course that we are studying now is defined as the second degree of thought about the past. It's, not, it's beyond the ordinary. It's beyond the regular level. When you tell somebody in chemistry, when you mix this, mix this, I remember in my secondary school days when we were, when we'd be testing for starch, we would be told if you use if you bring litmus paper and you pour the iodine, it's going to turn blue black. Now that is you are talking about one chemical, and the person that is the, putting litmus paper there, all of them are just trying to t find out. So if it didn't turn blue black, then the test for starch is either not correct or starch is not present. 
Now, these are human beings. When you are talking about human beings, what you are going to find is that they can deliberately shift focus. What we use to study them is historiography. The background that will make you to be a good historian, that will make you to be different from ordinary storytellers in the society, is what we call historiography or philosophy of history. Now, the lesson of today. I want to tell you that one of my great teachers in those days at Great Ife, almost in you know, in their famous book, The Great Ife, History of the World University 1962 to 1987, defined historiography as the, the, the discipline that deals with the methods of writing history and the techniques of historical investigation. No. When you look at this definition, you are going to see something. Let me give it to you again. They, they said historiography is the discipline that deals with the method of writing history and the techniques of historical investigation. What does that portend? That definition gives you one thing. One is given an impression that historiography consists of a number of disciplines that will make the work of a historian easy and possible, and perhaps objective. So this discipline includes, but they are not limited to the ones I'm going to mention. When you want to look at what historiography is, you will need the assistance of a number of disciplines, and one of them is linguistics. For instance, you want to know how, where somebody hails from, listen to his language. So when you see a Yoruba man speaking, it is easy for you to know that this man, even if he's, he's, he's speaking Latin. I remember a research that was carried out by one of my uh, guys in this place many years back. That was Professor Osisan Wu. Professor Osisan Wu gathered a number of people, went around to record how people speak their English. And he, he interviewed one man who was in fine art department, now of blessed memory too, late Mr. Uh, Uju. I think M.O. Uju, I can't remember Baba's initial, who of fine art department. When Baba was given the text to read, Baba was just reading the thing purely like an equity man. So you don't need to think too much before you know that this man reading the text is reading English. And it was given to somebody who, act, who read English from somewhere else. So when you give it to somebody else from another place, you can obviously see it and across the world give your work to somebody from India and he's reading it for you. You will be hearing something like, because of the way he is raised and the, the inherent nature of that language with which he grew up. That's, that makes it impossible for us to study a people without understanding their language. Then we talk about disciplines like anthropology, disciplines like numismatics. Numismatics is the study of coins. You know, when you take a particular coin, you can tell. How old? When I was coming, when I was growing my in my young days, uh, late sixties and the early seventies, there was a particular coin we called toro. It 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 was difficult for people from other part of Nigeria, aside from Yoruba land, to pronounce it. And that was one of the things that the, that the Hausa people used against Igbo people when they were capturing them before the civil war. You know, they asked them to leave their place and they were returning. They were asking them to pronounce Toro and it is difficult for an Igbo man to pronounce Toro easily. So they have to be saying Toro, Toro, as they pronounce it. No, this one is not a Yoruba man. Because they don't want Hausa, they don't want Igbo people to cross without being killed. Those, now that is just by the way. You use the language of the people. You use their rhetorics. You use their numismatics understanding. To, you know, use their logic. There are other disciplines like botany, you know, you can just decide to look at a people and what they eat. By the time you gather the food they eat, you can obviously see who they actually were. So we can bring in disciplines like botany. And then you see, the, you just take a particular plant. For instance, you can just take a wedu. I don't know the botanical name of a wedu, but you can, I know a wedu is one leaf that we eat in Yoruba land. We use it to heat Amala very well. If you take a wedu and you want to look at the, Buddha, the origin of Yoruba people, when they began to heat it, you can study it from the beginning to the end and trace when or where a wedu came from and how they began to. These are the things that you understand when you are properly sand in what we call historiography. Now, moving to the next thing I'm talking about, 
um, this definition of uh, almost in an added, you know, suggests that historiography is concerned with the method of writing history. It's, it suggests that historiography is concerned with the methods of writing history. Now, this is talking about approaches. You see, when you want to do, when you want to do history, historical research, there are some approaches that are not acceptable. Like I told you earlier, you can't just go out and distribute questionnaire, and people will feel it, and then you see that you say you are, you are analyzing, and then you are writing history. What you are writing at that time is possibly something useful in political science. I'm not too sure it's going to be admissible as a, as a work of research in history. Uh, in those days when I was doing one of my researches, I carried out in, I think in Ikiru, I met a man who wrote a book on Ikiru, asked me what he wrote. And when I finished reading through the author, I asked myself, who wrote this? And I asked a number of questions. But I discovered that the man, number one, was commissioned to write history of, of that place. And number two, he wasn't even a Yoruba man, he was an Igbo man. So you give an Igbo man all documents about your town to write. He has a biased mind from the background of his art. So he's not likely to produce something sensible or something acceptable. So when we are looking at this, we are talking about approaches. If we have to bring in theories, what are the theories that are acceptable, acceptable in history? I did my major work on boundary, and I had to bring in a theory from science. Uh, I think I, let me see if I can still remember the theory I brought in. Uh, the fact that when animals are kept together in a particular location, they behave in a particular way, and you cannot imagine it. They have a sense of boundary where their where their world ends and where another person's territory begins. And I, I got this in my days, in my secondary school days, when we were taught the way a gamma lizard, lizard operates in their territory. So I came up with a theory with the with the concept of territoriality, and that was what I used to define my work to create the base for my work in boundary studies. That is to tell you that we bring in theories, we bring in models, we bring in genres, we bring in uh, approaches to solve models, to solve historical problems. Moreover, this definition of uh, Omoseni and, uh, Omoseni and uh, Adedino also suggests or agrees that historiography deals with the techniques of carrying out historical investigations. You see, you go to places, you, see, you hear a lot of things that people do, you come back and then you, I, you organize how you are going to gather your data. Now, there is what we call interview, interview method. You go out with a method, you gather your information, and then you, after you have interviewed the people, you come back home. Now, if you are doing it elsewhere, other than history, then you prepare what we call interview guide. You give them interview guide, they study it. You know, when you are writing history, you don't give people that are going to be answering your question inter interview guide. They, they, you just get there, you tell them what you want to do. If they have an answer for it, they start telling you. If they don't have an answer, they tell you to come back. If you come back, you go back to them two, three, four times. You are, you are trying to gather your data, and you are trying to, be, to gather a data about the, about the past. About the past, not just any past. You are trying to gather your data about a past that is genuine, that is objective. That definition I'm talking about also agrees that historiography deals with techniques of carrying out historical investigation. This includes interviews, like I've said, documents, you go to the National Archives, you gather uh, colonial papers, and then you come around to analyze. Now, another scholar that I would like to use in this lesson was David Seale. David Seal, in his definition, in his definition of historiography, equates philosophy of history and historiography to the same thing, or what he called the criticism of historical writing. The, the criticism of historical writing. You don't just write things, you write them with, with a critical mind. With a critical mind. And this definition gives an impression that history as a language and it has a method as well. So when we are talking about the language of history and the method of history, let me also tell you, when I was writing my, I think what my MPhil thesis, and I give it out, my supervisor then, Professor Shola Olomola, will read the work and say, young man, you are not writing 
in historical past. I ask myself, which one is lighting in historical past now? I will go back, I package the thing, I bring it back, and we say, this is this thing, this work that you are doing is not minutes. It's not minutes. You are not writing the minute of a meeting. You are writing, you must be writing. So it has a language. It has a way you package it. You don't present people things that have happened in the past and uh, talking about them as if they just happened or they are happening. Even if some of them are still happening, they are governed by a principle of what has happened in the past. So it has a language and it has a method. I've told you earlier about the language of about the method that you go out to gather your data. Then you return back, sit down to analyze. It's not just one going out to gather data and returning to write. The next time you go out again to validate the earlier data you gathered and then you come back. Don't forget, all of, all of those may be interviewed. You went to the man, you ask him question, what is your name? You go back to him again, you ask him, what is your name? You go back the third time, you ask him, what is your name? Two things are likely to happen. He's, 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 he's likely to be furious with you and say, why are you asking me what is my name? What is my name? What is my name? Three times. I want to know why you are asking me in his fury. That is where you will get some of the information you actually needed. It has a method. And that method must be followed. If you are not going to be probably writing a story. Because writing history is different from writing stories. If you take the, the work of uh, Chino Achebe, you are reading about the work of Chino Achebe. What you are reading, inside it you will find a number, a lot of history, but they are presented in, in literary form. The narration is presented in such a way, if you take the work of Olaru Tini, for instance, you are going to be seeing them, they will be talking about uh, Obaisi. And as they are talking about it, they are actually telling you history. But what they are telling you, they are not using the language of history at that point. So it is possible for you to write something that looks like history. Uh, Achebe wrote, there was a country. If you take there was a country and you are reading it as a novelist, as a student of literature, what you will see there will just be the story of a country that existed. But that is probably no more. But if you take it as a historian and you are reading it, you are going to be seeing the story of the Nigerian Civil War and the rise of Biafra. So that's why, what, what I mean when I say history, in the opinion of David Seale, has a language, it also has a method. So, and this method and this language must be followed. In fact, you must follow it strictly if you want to really, really make something serious out of history. Uh, Seal, in his work, explained that that method must be strictly followed. Now, going to the idea of Atomawik, Mawik was another scholar who in his famous work, The Nature of History, uh, explained that historiography is that aspect of history that has the potential to show us where our predecessors, our predecessors were entrapped by the fallacies of their age. Now, the implication of that is those who have passed through this road before, they made some mistakes. Take a government of a particular country, for instance, and just look at the government of that period, that, that say, the colonial government in Nigeria. Why, why did they make the mistakes they made? For instance, there were traditional system of justice in Nigeria, across board, Hausa land, Yoruba land, Igbo land, Iberia land, Nope land, Jokun, all across. There were traditional methods of judiciary settling this dispute. But they came, and what did we see? They imposed their own judicial system, the British judicial system, without putting in our custom and practices, norms into, into, into consideration. So what, what we saw was that they were unable to avert, to handle the fallacies of the age before them. Now, we have the shoulders of our, of our predecessors to stand on so that we will be able to 
avert the fallacies of our own age. Now, we can't avert the fallacy of their own age anymore because they have already made those mistakes. They have already committed those errors. But we can stand on their shoulders to see beyond our nose and also avert the crisis of our own age. Invariably, without carrying the argument too far, one can see that definition of historiography could be summed up in the number of things. Number one, what is historiography? Somebody will expect you to, to say that historiography is about history writing. If you want to write history, how do you write it? If you are not going to be writing stories, when you think that you are writing history, how do you write it? You must follow the method. You must follow the language. Now, the next is that historiography is talking about the practice of methodology. That is, if you don't use the correct method, what you are doing we also, we also hand like Achebe's work. Achebe was writing about the, the, the rise and the fall of Biafra. But if you hold the book, what you are going to see is what Achebe is writing. He wasn't writing as a historian. He was writing merely as a novelist. Merely as... Uh, but he was using historical data to write what he was writing. Now, historiography... Is summed up in this place as the study of the practice and method which is beyond only written history. Now, this is where I'm going to say some few things again. People used to believe that history began and ended, or history started at the age, at that time when people began to write things down. There can be no beginning of history. You cannot say history started when people started writing down things. No. There have been things, actions of people and inactions of people have been on before people take to writing. Europeans will want you to believe that history began when men took to writing. But that is not true. That is what will lead me to the next short discussion, historiography in, in epochs. Historiography in epochs. Now, although historiography began to exist as an academic discipline in the 19th century, there had been historical consciousness from the classical age. There had been historical consciousness from the classical age. In fact, beyond the classical age, there had been historical consciousness. If not, how will you explain the history of the Yoruba, the origin of the Yorubas, that they were coming, when Odudua and uh, Orumila, when they were coming from heaven? Olodumare gave them five toad pigeons and gave them a patch of sand that when they get to the universe, they should pour the sand and then they should throw down the, the pigeon, the five toad pigeon, to scatter it. That is to tell you that people have been thinking about where did we come from before the arrival of the colonial mass, not to talk of before anybody. So, has it not occurred to you yourself, even you? You, my student, has it not occurred to you before? Now you just ask yourself, why were your fathers, why, why were they settled here? How did they get to Ondo? How did they get to Akwai land? How did they get to Ikari land? How did they get to Ikiti land? How did, how did they get there? Because you see, when you get to some locations in Ikiti, you will see a man with tribal mark of Oyo, complete tribal or your tribal mark, but it's an Ikiti man. I recently met a man in one of the functions I attended with an Ondo tribal mark. And I was already interacting with the man as if I have met somebody from Ondo since I've been here for quite some time. And when we were going to part, I asked him, what particular area of Ondo are you from? He said, no, I'm not an Ondo man. This is the kind of tribal mark that we carry in a family. Like those of us who are from the royal family, I said, this is another work. That means some people are wearing crown in a family like that had their origin somewhere in Nundu. I said, well, that is just an assertion. I will need to do my investigation to come out clearly with this. That is why we study historiography in epochs. That's why we talk about historiography in epoch. And... We are going to be looking at these epochs in four dimensions. Yeah, at least we'll be looking at four phases of this epoch. 
Number one, the classical age. That is classical historiography. Number two, medieval historiography. Number three, Renaissance historiography. And number four, modern historiography. Now, we are going to be looking, just mentioning briefly the characteristics of this, even as I close this class. Then I will give you a question, which I will summarize what is expected of you when you are responding to that question. Character of uh, the classical age. Now, classical historiography, what was its character? It was characterized by the focus on kings and their exploits. In the classical age, you will rarely hear about any, any other woman being except the king. They will say one king died, another king ruled. Another king came on throne, one king died, and this king chased this, this man away, another king came on board. Probably that is why in Yoruba land they refer to history as Obaku Obaje. It was their focus on the classical historiography that gave them that perception of history. Then we talk about the medieval historiography. This was a, a period where everything was about God. God. For those of us who have been privileged to read or lay our hands on history of the Yorubas by Samuel Johnson, you will recall that Johnson will tell us a very fantastic story. A well-investigated data. He will put it down and then he will say, Kurumi was going to face this because God was against him. Sometimes when I read such work, I will say, what actually went wrong with, with uh, Samuel Johnson? Well, he was a reverend. He was a priest, so he had no choice. He had to be looking at things from the perception of a, of a priest. And that's why, when he's going to be drawing his conclusion, now, if you look at what happened between Kurumi and the Baden, and the Baden warriors, and the destruction of Ijayi, you will see that Kurumi was actually fighting, the, fighting a just cause. I don't know whether time will permit me to mention briefly what happened between Bada and Ijayi. Anala, I think, was supposed to be put on the throne. And normally in Oyo, Arema dies with the, with the Alavi, is buried with him. As soon as the, the Alavi is to be buried, Arema is buried with him. The moment, the day that Alavi, Alavi is installed like this, his son, that's the Arema, his first son, also becomes a very important person in the society. If he sees a beautiful wife of another chief and places his leg on it, that's the end. Because they know that he's going to also die the day his father dies. Now, Arema Adelu was to be installed as king. It, that was contrary to tradition. That was contrary to tradition. And Kurumi was the area on the Kakan for us at that time. So Kurumi said, no, this is wrong. Ademadelu should die with his father. And the Baden soldier said, no, we are not going to wait and allow this to happen. So they said, we are going to ins install him, whether you like it or not. Because Kurumi doesn't have or did not have all it takes to oppose them. He stopped them, they would not stop. So he insisted and installed Aremadelu. With time, a woman in the territory of, Allah, of uh, Kurumi died without addressing the issue of her will. We say that woman died intestate. When a person dies without writing his will or distributing his or her properties, they say he died intestate. Now, this woman died intestate. And if, a, if such a rich person dies intestate in Yoruba land, within the territory of a particular king, all the properties of that person re, they revert to the king. Now, this woman that died intestate lives within the territory of Are Onekaka and Are Kurumi. Now, Are Kurumi was insisting that since Adelu was not qualified to be king in the first place, the property of that woman cannot revert to him. And the Baden Suja says, no, we are going to make sure that that property reverts back to our, to our, to our own Allah thing that we put there. Their intention was to change the order, the traditional order in Yoruba land, and that they succeeded in doing. By the time they brought down Kurumi, defeated him, Adelu remained, and that was what we have today. Talking about Renaissance historiography, this was characterized by its focus 
on humanism excessively. On humanism. Everything in the Renaissance historiography was about God, about, sorry, about human being. Don't forget, under medieval historiography, it was all about God, God, God. When they cannot explain something, they trace it to the divine. They say, they say it's God that has done it. And when we move to the Renaissance historiography or the era of, his, of Renaissance historiography, we discovered that everything was always traced to human being. When somebody did something and uh, we, 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 we always trace it to human being, even where the, the man was not or uh, could not actually lay claim to those things. And then we moved to modern historiography where the story changed. This was characterized by issues like racialism, imperialism, colonialism, and we begin to see all manner of, uh, uh, maybe I should add the last one, nationalism. It was an era when things now began to take another definition. When somebody is unable to build his house, we say it was the colonial masters that took over the land that my father would have given me. When somebody is unable to, to make his country work fine, he will say it was the imperialists from Britain that did not allow us. And today we have a lot of such problems in Africa, across Africa. I told you earlier that I was going to give you uh, a question. Uh, let me use that question as my summary. Let me use that question as my summary. Philosophy of history is the interaction between the past and the historian's conception of that past. Philosophy of history is the interaction between the past and the historian's conception of that past. I will expect anybody who will answer this question to go back to the beginning of our lecture today and tell us what Omar Sinyan Adi Dina said about historiography, what uh, David Seal said about historiography, what uh, Atomawik said about historiography, and uh, look at historiography in epochs. Thank you so much, and I appreciate you for listening. Kill the guy now. Run the gun. Eat him. What is this? Good day, sir. You are watching Japan in my house. Who is King Kong, sir? Eh? King Kong. You, you've never heard of ACTV before in your life. ACTV is very educative, informative, and there are, for most part, there, there is entertainment. There are a lot of things you can You can even attend lectures here. All you know is watch all those nonsense artists and do, do nonsense, or uh, you watch nonsense on TV. Eh? Last night, you almost came in bed with your fist. It's not me, sir. Eh? You, and you wake up every morning, the bed will be so rough, like you've been fighting off your dream. Eh? That's really why you have F's in your course, like but special have, for you. I have you last semester. E, we eat by pounds for you. Very stupid. We are changing that session to ACTV right now. And, oh, God, the baby was too happy for us, boy. Stupid boy.